please join me in welcoming David Mervish. <laughs> David, it's so great to be with you. Um, I, I mentioned um, just previously that for my entire career, from the beginning of my career, I was always hearing about David Mervish. And, um, and um, when we finally met in 2000 at the first exhibition I did with Frank Stella, um, I was completely surprised at how young you were in 1990, uh, in, in 2000. And um, for, because you were a legend in this field. So how young were you when you started <laughs> doing this? Well, uh, funny, thank you. And thank you everyone for being here too. It's a little surprising and very flattering and very encouraging. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, I had just uh, turned 19 when I opened a gallery in September of 1963. And it really came out of uh, a desire to put off going to university. We had uh, 13 uh, grades before in Ontario and uh, the idea of a gap year just didn't exist. And so you went to work or you went to school or you went to jail. And uh, <laughs> the last option wasn't one I was interested in. The other two, uh, I, I, I thought, how do I manage this? Well, I take a year off and my father had a store uh, and he had just bought a live theater. He had bought uh, the Royal Alexandra, which was built in 1907. And uh, all the offers had been to tear it down and make a parking lot, but uh, because a new theater had been built uh, called the O'Keefe Center, and they didn't think they needed this theater anymore. And uh, my mother had been studying at the new school in New York with Tom Doyle, who was a sculptor, who was married to Eva Hess at the time. And uh, she was going out to Siegel's Farm to Happenings at the time, and she was reporting back to my father. And his buying the theater lured her home. So uh, I could say to my father, you're renting stores for $300 a month. I have six months rent. My mother, I could say, I'm going to be an art dealer. And I just thought I'd sit in the back room and read Ulysses. <laughs> get away for, from it for a year. But doesn't it, what life isn't that simple. And 1963 was a magical time because for many of us, how do we enter an area where we're unfamiliar? Where there's, how, how do you begin to look at pictures? Uh, I was very lucky because as a 16 year old, my mother had taken me to a Jack Bush exhibition in Toronto and it was unlike anything I thought paintings were. Uh, and I don't know that I reacted that favorably, but I certainly reacted to the idea this was something new. And also in my last year in high school, uh, John Ruald's books on Impressionism came out. So the history of Impressionism and the history of Post-Impressionism talked about artists who somehow had endured beyond the time when they made their pictures. And this idea that art had a relevance beyond the moment in which we lived. And when you knew that there were hundreds of artists when those artists existed, and how did you pick the 10 artists that might be relevant for a longer period of time? And that wasn't what I had in mind in the first year, but by the second year, that began to be an element in how to go about looking. You, would it look better tomorrow than it did today? Was it challenging today? And could you accept the challenge of that and not pick the pictures you're confident of, but pick the pictures you were unsure of? Well, what's amazing is, you know, doing the exhibition, the works look as fresh today as they must have looked when they were first made. They really hold up, they really look so relevant today. And even though I've spent so much time thinking, you know, 
somewhat many years thinking about these works and looking at these works, I saw all new, um, new, new things happen when I started well, working on it. I loved what you wrote, about Bonnie, on the didactic information, because I thought this, this is an opening of doors, and this, you can look at the pictures without reading anything, but you can also, after you've looked at the pictures and had your reaction, see how it folds into the history of what went on. Uh, and I understood exactly that date of 1983 when you stopped because of the show at the Royal Academy in London. The spirit. And there was a time when so many new ways of making art came into being up to that 83 different, you know, it got, the 70s seemed very confusing as we entered into them. We look back at it and we see extraordinary accomplishment, but we didn't know how to sort the 70s. But by 1983, this new spirit show in London said it was all right to paint again, because for a while, if you taught in a school and you painted on canvas, you didn't have a job. You couldn't be an art teacher in that time. And so suddenly making paintings was again okay. And it wasn't okay to make abstract paintings, but now, in the light of the show you did about those people who grad graduated from Yale, it's far enough along that abstraction is acceptable again. And so to look back at the roots of abstraction, which I guess is Strindberg in, 2000, in 1902, painting the moon on the water and it being a totally abstract picture, uh, and looking at how old those roots are and how long it's taken to accept this, uh, I still feel like there's a big future and a big, a lot of room for people to still do, be original and do something exciting. I think that's one of the biggest messages of this exhibition because one of the things I wanted to do is bring everyone back to this moment, the 60s, you know, 50s, 60s, um, that there had already been about 20 years of abstract expressionism in America and then there was another um, you know, another generation continuing the, um, the, the, what the first generation had achieved. And then you have another group of artists who, you know, have accepted the idea that to be, to be modern is to be, a, is to be an abstract and completely committed to abstraction. But then how to, how do you make abstraction new? And that in fact, they all proved that there was a lot of room still left to, to move forward and find new ideas and new ways of doing it. And be so individual. And, and you know, right. You know, it, 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 it's, it wasn't the artist that created the movement. It isn't a movement, it's a, a label right. that the critics have put on it. And, and nobody likes it. Well, <laughs> the, but at the same time, there are commonalities mm -hmm. and, you know, the, and to have achieved something individually and, and yet to not have, I, you've taken it to a step where we've added a lot of people uh, that weren't in a show recently in Japan, but there still are many, many more people around the world who were affected by this moment in American freedom of choice and individuality that so much of this art represents. And, well, how, how would you, because, you know, I say in the introduction that this is not a definitive list because of Colorville, because that's impossible, because there isn't a definitive list. How would you define what, I'd love to hear from you who've looked at this since 1963, um, 62, um, how would you define what Colorfield is? I, I, I never tried to define it uh, in an encompassing way, uh, I've always seen individuals doing something that makes me compelled to want to look at what they make. So uh, Anthony Caro, who's a British artist and is not in this show, today it doesn't seem so radical, but in 1964 to have sculptures sprawl across the ground and not come up off onto a pedestal was a pretty radical thing in that moment. There have been all sorts of things that have gone beyond that today, 
Uh, but uh, for me, that was a turning point in looking at, at work because it was as if color came off the wall into the middle of the room. And yet by 1970, Caro had abandoned that mm -hmm. and went on to do something else. So all these artists keep creating something that surprises me. And I try to guess, and then I never get it right. They always come up with something more original than what I thought we were, where we were going. And they all often are, sometimes they surpass me in a way that I don't keep up. And then I have to come back. Uh, there was a moment with Frank Stella when, you know, I, I, I followed it to 73 and then I stopped for a while. Now I stopped having a gallery in 78, but I realized how much I'd missed in not looking carefully at what Frank was doing. And I tried to partake a little more to see what it was all about and to see how I could relate to it. And I always thought Frank was one of the smartest people I ever knew whether it was in the art world or outside of the art world. It had nothing to do with just the art world. So I knew that I, I should be paying attention here. And, uh, you know, it's, or, you know, how intuitive Larry has been over the years and how extraordinary. We've had, I've had a wonderful journey. Uh, and uh, I think probably in some ways, I wouldn't have found my way without Jack Bush. You know, Jack opened the door. Uh, he, he just, he was gently saying, look, just look and see you know, how you respond. And, you know, Jack was a senior artist before he really found his way. And he was 52 when he went to Europe for the first time. He came back and he lived in the Chelsea Hotel for a couple weeks. And Ken Nolan said to him, what did you like, Jack? What did you see? And he said, well, you know, I, I saw these Matisses for the first time and I was really wowed by it. And Ken said, well, why don't you try and beat them? And that concept of you could make something as exciting as Matisse wasn't about one artist beating another, but it was more about that's inspiring, that's exciting, the idea of color being emotional, carrying something for us. Uh, well, let's find out. Let's find out what happens if we put Mr. Blue next to Mr. Yellow. You know, what, what, all of those experiences and to be able to be, you know, listening at the door, but it wasn't listening, it was looking. It was being able to walk into a museum, you know, and, and see all, the, you know, that, that bravura in a Manet, to look at, older pictures through the light of the time in which we live. You know, suddenly it opened doors to everything in, in many ways. Well, you know, it, it, what you're talking about is ambition. And um, in the exhibition, I have a quote from Larry Poons who insisted it was about ambition, what this cohort, and it's important to realize this is a group of artists who knew each other, hung out with each other, I'm sure argued with each other, you know, but um, it was ambition, but it's ambition, not so much for themselves, but ambition for what painting could be. And I, I think that that is um, something that I, is, I hope the young artists that we have, or any of the artists that we have here today, that that's something that they take to heart, that they realize that, they're, that the power that they're painting or their art can have. I, I think seeing other people succeed is exciting and encourages you to, to do something of your own that answers it. It's, it's, uh, I remember once uh, sitting in on auditions for a play and the actress and the director were talking to each other uh, and giving each other lines and I mistakenly said something when one of the actresses were out of the room and the director turned to me and he said, okay, you read in with the next actress. <laughs> okay. And it was a friend of mine, Barbara Chilcott, who I had enormous respect for. She was a wonderful actress and I had to read the lines. I can tell you, 
unless you're an expert tennis player, you can't hit that ball back across the net. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, I gained respect both for the actors and the performers. And I think that same respect is in all the arts. You know, you, uh, those people who play the game at the top, uh, they're, they're champions. They're not, uh, and it's not accidental. And, and, and making abstract art that's intelligent is a challenge. It's a great challenge. Well, you know, you, you talk about Jack Bush, and I think there's probably very few people in our audience here in, in South Florida that know Jack Bush, who is Canadian. And, um, and one of the things about Colorfield, I think it's one of the first of the American tendencies of art that did spread out into different areas. I mean, um, Nolan and Lewis lived in, uh, Ken, Kenneth Nolan and Morris Lewis lived in Washington, D.C. And after that, you know, origin story of going to Helen Frankenthaler's studio in 1953 with um, Clement Greenberg and seeing her first um, stained painting, Mountains and Sea, uh, which was painting in 52, that it was a crystallizing moment for them not that they were going to repeat what she did, but it gave them what they needed to get over that hump and find their own way. And they go, they, they live in, they live in Washington D.C. and share this moment with other artists, and it becomes the Washington Color School. Um, and we've seen a few artists already that came up. One of them being Alma Thomas, um, which isn't in your collection, but um, uh, is, uh, was part of the color field along uh, in Washington D.C. along with Sam Gilliam, so that spawned it. But there was also up in Canada. There was in Western Canada the Regina Five, who I think were influenced by what was going on in New York and wanted contact. Uh, Emma Lake invited it's, Barnett it's, Newman and later Saskatchewan. other people in Saskatchewan to come and be guest artists. Uh, Robert Murray, who was a sculptor out there, ended up living in the United States and showing with the Whitney at the Whitney Annual. And uh, uh, there, there was a great deal of, of interaction. Um, I recently heard from Kenneth Brummel, who's a curator in New Zealand, that there was a woman who was influenced by a lecture that Clem gave in New Zealand in the early 70s, uh, and who paints pictures that would be interesting for me to see. I haven't seen images yet, and, but uh, I know that Piero Durazio, an Italian artist, lived in New York from 60 to 70. Uh, Paul Feely, who taught at Bennington, Bennington. is interesting. Uh, Damien Hirst acknowledged that he was inspired by dot paintings by Thomas Downing in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, there, um, I look at Hontai uh, taking uh, the material and bunching it and then opening it. And I look at uh, Sam Gilliam folding and ideas were being exchanged all over the world that this painting inspired, was part of, and other people were part of that makes me think there are 30 or 40 other shows that can grow out of these shows. So there's a long future ahead looking back, and there's a bigger future if it can, continues to inspire the people who work now. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, um, we, let's see, unfortunately, we're now up to a, the title page, but um, one of the interesting things where um, um, your two careers, well, one's a hobby or, or an obsession, let's put yes. it that way, and the other one's your career in, in theater. Um, the origin of the um, Nolan this and that and um, paintings that they'll be showing up here. Um, I just recently met um, the dealer in um, a dealer in uh, Dallas who showed me that she that that by Nolan was in a collection in Dallas and that she actually sold that painting to, I guess, to another gallery that 
eventually ended which sold up with it to another gallery, gallery that sold it to me. That sold it to you. And, and this was important because you originally owned both this and that, right? Well, originally I owned that. That, okay. And I, and I uh, uh, found it with uh, Char Charles Millard, who at the time was the deputy director of the Fog in 65. Oh, I'm cool. okay. But, but um, uh, Bonnie, the, uh, Char Charlie had two Nolans and he couldn't hang either. He lent one to a museum and he traded with me for uh, a large sculpture of Tony Caro's called Wide and a painting of Jules Olitsky called Ariosto Kiss, uh, which was a fairly large picture and another smaller Olitsky. And I thought, I have a wonderful Nolan circle. I discovered that there was another picture that had once the, been one painting called This and That and had been cut in half and there was another part to it and it was in a collection in London. So I asked Leslie Waddington, who knew that collector, if they would consider selling it. So in 1971, I was able to add this to it. What I didn't know was that in 1960, Eugene Goosen had shown this and that, which had not yet been split at Bennington. And if you follow the convention that height goes first and then width, the painting had been shown as a 14 foot tall picture. I have never seen a photo and I haven't done the research yet because it's new information to me as to which painting was on top and which circle was on bottom. So I'm, or if in fact that's correct, I had always thought they were a horizontal when they were attached. And Canon made only one other double circle picture, one called half and half. And he had separated that also. And was that vertical or was it? Horizontal? It was a horizontal and uh, one part of it's in a museum and the other part I think is still private and it's unlikely it'll ever be reunited. So this is the only time where he's divided the picture and the two parts are together. Um, there was a moment when I put on so many shows with Sir Peter Hall that I had to give up some paintings and I gave up this. But I was fortunate because as you say, this collector had an exhibition of their collection and then they decided to sell their collection and the dealer found me and I was able to reunite them. So sometimes I make a lot of errors in my life and if I put on the wrong plays, sometimes the paintings rescue me. <laughs> but they aren't orphans. If I can bring them back home, I will bring them back home. And so, you know, the picture is with us and we're able to show the two yeah, together. Yeah. And, and yeah, the, and that was really important to be able to put both this and that together. I, I, I thought so. Yeah. And uh, I, I did, you know, I was reluctant. On the other hand, I had an amazing period with Sir Peter Hall and we did 14 different plays together. And this was at the Old Vic. In the Old Vic and we did it in repertory for 40 weeks and we were both insane. And it was perfect. <laughs> well, you actually, you and your father, didn't you own the old thing? We did for okay. a while. For yes. a while. And then for you, 15 years. And you restored it and gave it back to the British government? Or? Originally, originally, the old Vic had been the home for Shakespeare in 1907 or 9. Olivier. Olivier ran it for a while and it became what turned into the National Theater. But in the early part of the century, it was desperately falling apart. And Lillian Bayless came from South Africa and said to her Aunt Emma Cons, I'll try to help you. And they turned to Shakespeare in desperation and they did all 37 plays, one after the other. And so that's why the Old Vic is quite, you know, so famous. It was the home of Shakespeare. And then uh, she was in front and a trolley ran her over and uh, People ran out into the street and said, who is it, who is it? And they said, it's Lillian Bayless. And with her dying breath, she raised her hand in, in, from the old Vic and she said, and Sadler Wells too. Oh. She wanted her full billing. <laughs> well, well, talk about um, 
divas. We have <laughs> Hel Helen Frankenthaler behind us. And um, what, how wide is that painting? 14 feet or 13? Oh, hidden from Busano? Yeah. Helen was asked to do a commission, uh, if I remember correctly. And she said, you know, I'm not going to paint specifically for that. I'll paint some large pictures and they can pick. And I heard about it while I was in the studio visiting her for some other purpose. And she had seven paintings and she showed them to me. And I said, may I uh, buy two of them? And she said, well, they'll have more than enough to pick from. And so I was able to, this was one of the paintings that I was able to, to choose at the time. So I was very fortunate. I, I, I'm glad I was there on the right day. It was an accident. Uh, I hope the people who came the next day were happy. I never checked. <laughs> they wouldn't know the difference probably. What, what I did find out years later was, uh, you know, because the title was intriguing, uh, Helen said that she had seen a, a painting by Bassano uh, in a museum on the West Coast, and I believe it's the one that uh, uh, is in Pasadena uh, with the Holy Family going down into Egypt, and that the colors in that painting were something that she wanted to work with, and that she used that to make the picture. And I think that's something, that's an important point about Helen Frankenthaler. Um, you know, I worked with her in 2007 or mm -hmm. six on a retrospective of her works on paper. Um, that how much of her, you know, that her art training, as many of that generation, was to look at the great masterpieces of art history and really absorb them and understand why they worked and to take and glean from that and that it becomes almost second nature in, in the making of it. And, and so seeing certain paintings for, for Frankenthaler, would, if it thrilled her, yeah. that she would absorb it and then she would come up with a way of how to translate that without it copying it but capturing what was it that made that painting so brilliant? And I think that's an important point to realize that, that she wasn't just pushing paint around, that she actually had something in mind that she wanted to achieve. Well, none of these paintings were accidents. They were, there are accidents in the painting that are decisions about whether or not one keeps them. But uh, these are people who have absorbed a lot of uh, uh, the world in many different ways, not just art, and they incorporated uh, their life experiences, I believe, into it. However, there is some constraint on that if you believe uh, what you see is what you see. Oh, we um, have the um, Morris Lewis. We haven't talked about Morris Lewis at all. No, um, he died relatively young, and um, uh, did you, but he died, he died in 62 and I started in so 63. 63. So you didn't know him? No, not now, at all. How, how important is it for you to know the artists? I didn't meet any of the artists until I knew their work first. And in a number of cases, I think most cases, I bought something before I ever met the artist. Uh, I, in fact, didn't really want to know the artists before I made my decision. I wanted to be influenced by the art, not the person. And, uh, you know, for better or worse, uh, it, you know, sometimes it, what, what we're left, you know, I guess I was told as I went along, I didn't know it at the beginning, but someone said, you know, we wear a mask in our daily life as to who we are and we present ourselves to other people in the way we hope we want to be seen. Uh, but if you're making art, you are alone and you go in your studio and you face yourself and you face your own truths. And therefore, the art speaks in a different way. And it may not reflect the person that we meet in the daily life with that person. And so I've sort of separated the two. Uh, some Times I'm very lucky and I end up with friends and I, they're people I like and I care about. And sometimes I don't let that get in the way of whether I 
like or don't like what they're making. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I try to be honest with myself about my own reaction mm -hmm. to what I'm looking at and puzzled yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we, each, we approach it the same way. Um, it's very rare I know the artist before I've made a decision about the work. Yeah. And then sometimes it's a really nice, they've gotten to Happy surprise. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. One thing, we managed to talk about color field for almost uh, 45 minutes without really delving into one of the people that was, has been associated with being so key with color field. And that's Clement Greenberg, the very mm -hmm. influential uh, art critic. And, um, and you know, one of the things I was thinking about with this exhibition is, you know, taking, you know, going back to that moment where the artists are really trying to create a whole new way of making art and um, a vocabulary and a way of, of working. And at the same time, you have critics trying to find the words to um, absorb and, and, and share what the, what they see the artists are doing, and then also coming up with a new criteria in order to, to judge works that are based on a whole new paradigm of what art is. And, um, for, and I would say in most cases, the artists, or in many cases, the artists didn't agree with the critics, or they had something to work against, as, as we have discussed. But can you talk about the, the role of Greenberg in color field? Well, Bonnie, I think the, so much art writing at, you know, in the 50s and 60s, uh, I, I see all criticism as a doorway to try and involve people, to, to make it easier to look at the work and form your own opinions. Um, and a lot of the writing was sort of romanticizing about how the picture was made rather than what the picture looked like at the end of the day that you were presented with, because I wasn't in the studio watching action painting going on. I was looking at the action painting after it was made. And so uh, in that sense, Greenberg's writing gave you something to push against or, 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 and, uh, or use, uh, but it, it, was, it was there in some way that, that uh, was meaningful. Um, Clem in his own life, uh, wore a different mask, I think, than the one he wore if he was in the studio with somebody. Uh, and for some artists, I think he was helpful in saying something like, that's, that, when you did that, that looks pretty good. What more can you do with that? Or that picture's too pat. Is there a way you can, you know, so, some people thought that, well, well, Clem is telling people how to paint. Uh, that, that, I don't think that was true, and I don't think the artists who respected him necessarily rejected or accepted that suggestion. They made of it what they wanted. And they, but what was interesting about Clem, because I only saw him a couple times with artists looking at new art in a studio, was that he prepared himself by not looking at what he was about to see. He would look to the wall and ask to be told when it was in place and hanging. And then he'd turn around and have his own instant reaction to it. I also learned that you couldn't, clamp, you couldn't ever quote Clem, that he might have said something about a work of art at one time, and on seeing it again at another time, might have a very different reaction. And therefore, as a young art dealer, uh, I was once offered a painting by Morris Lewis called Winged Victory uh, by Kasman, a dealer in London. And this was a picture that he, Clement Greenberg had used to illustrate an article in Art International about Nolan and Lewis. So I assumed that Greenberg liked it. And 
it was given to me to sell and I phoned Lewis Cabot, who was a collector in Boston. And I said, you know, Wing Victory is available and there's the price. And he said, well, does Clem like it? I said, I think he likes it. He put it in this article. And he said, okay, I'll ask Clem. And if he says yes, I'll send you an email saying yes, yes. Yes, he likes it. Yes, I'll buy it. And if he doesn't, I'll send you an email saying no, no. <laughs> I got the second email. Oh. So quoting Clem, I learned that very early, was a mistake. You know, Clem was there to give you an honest reaction that you could use in whatever way you wanted. And if it was useful, the artist took it. And if it wasn't, the great artists were smart enough to pick what was useful and what wasn't. But it was their art, not Clem's. Clem was a, someone who was a doorkeeper who helped open the door. And I value anyone who opens the door in any way. I think that this is complicated enough in some ways and beautiful enough on another that the art opens the door by itself. The, the artist creates something that we slowly catch up with them with. And when we catch up with them, I mean, we're looking at pictures now that are 50 years old and they look like they were done yesterday. And, you know, will they endure? You know, it was a question when would another generation, because when it's made, there are people who collect. Uh, and it's a struggle to have it seen and collected. And how many artists are collected in, of the thousands of artists? And then will those collectors keep it through their lifetime or will they tire of it next year or the year after? And many of these pictures were kept for a lifetime. And then when they finally did let go, was there someone there who wanted to be there to take care of it? And each time, a whole wave of those pictures have gone into museums. So you look at Monet's water lilies, he did over 300 of them. But how many of them after 100 years are still in private hands? And that was something that was cherished. And that was what I was reading as a 16-year-old into Impressionism. So very early on, I went to Wildenstein and I wanted a red doll. And I asked to look at them and the man who was showing them to me said, so you're a young art dealer, what do you show? And I told him, and he said, there are thousands of artists in the world, nobody will remember any of those people. <laughs> so that was encouraging. <laughs> and you know, you have to believe in something or not. And, you know, I'm having the rewards, whether I'm right or wrong, I don't, I don't care in the end, really. I care for the art because I really believe there's something of value here. Mm -hmm. But I'm having the best time in my life when I'm alone standing in front of one of these paintings. Uh, that's all I want. I'm happy with that. That's like going to a concert, you know, and l listening to Mahler you know, or listening to a great few. Uh, this is, uh, this is, a, 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 you know, I'm, a, I'm an old guy now. I'm 79 and I only have another 25, 30 years to go. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm going to hang in and find out how and it I works out. I think most out. of our artists are going to outlive you. <laughs> well, so far they're doing a good job and I want them to beat me on it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, they should outlive me. Well, we're talking about museums, um, the role that the museums play in perpetuating um, this work is really important. And one of the museums that did make an early and strong commitment uh, and made sense being in Washington, D.C. is the National Gallery of Art. And that sort of brings us round to the origin of this exhibition because a young artist, um, er um, Eric N., he uses his middle initial, at Mac, who grew up in Baltimore, spent most of his childhood in the National Gallery. His father worked in the exhibition design department for the National Gallery. And, he, and that's where he 
developed this love for color field painting. And when I worked with him on the solo show that we gave him, was it 2018, 19, 19? Um, in discussing this with him, to find out that he grew up in the National Gallery, I said, well, not only were you influenced by Helen Frankenthaler, you were influenced by the work by Helen Frankenthaler, the pivotal work, Mountains and Sea. Mm. And, um, and it was really, and he's one of the artists who, and it was also one of the reasons I did the exhibition about the um, generation of artists of color who attended Yale for graduate school from 2000, uh, 2000 to 2010. Um, he was there in two, the tail end. And because he, he, he actually said to me one, I'm a formalist. And I looked at him, I said, don't you know that became a dirty word yeah. um, to be a formalist. And he brought this whole new fresh approach to looking at color field and abstraction that really was in tune with the way that I had been working with these artists and realized we needed to do this exhibition because this whole new generation is looking at, at this work. Well, e even now, I mean, Hans Hoffman hasn't been given his due. And he was such a, 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 had such range that people are only beginning to accept the messy pictures, the thin pictures, I mean, there's so much in him still that can be mined and used. There were whole careers he didn't bother following. He had had so many ideas. And that's true of a lot of, uh, of what we're looking at. There's room. So, you know, I, I think there'll be a lot of abstraction yet to come, but there's a lot to celebrate in what's already been achieved. Well, and talking about Halfman, it's um, a um, essay by Frank Stella in 1999 on Hoffman. Um, and particularly d talking about his painting, Gloria Mundi, that gives this exhibition its title. And um, so we've come completely back to the beginning of our exhibition. And David, you know, it's just so much, it's such a joy to be with you and your passion for art and love for art and the artist um, is exceptional. Bonnie, thank you for having me. No, thank it's been you. nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs>